Hertz has got it, wants to throw. Hertz setting up the screen. It is complete and blown up. Miles Sanders caught it. Malcolm Rodriguez was there waiting for him. That's a big play by Rodrigo. Welcome to this week's edition of the 20 Minute in the Huddle podcast presented by Microsoft. And it's been a busy week in Allen Park. You know, it started with uh, Aubrey Pleasant being, um, you know, let go from from his defensive uh, backs job. And um, obviously that's a tough situation for everyone involved, players, coaches. You never want to see that happen. But look, as Dan Campbell has said before, it's a results based business. And, you know, this defense hasn't been good enough. And, and the secondary is is the primary culprit. Um, just too many missed assignments, too many blown coverages, uh, too many mistakes. And, you know, when those things happen, unfortunately, sometimes, you know, people lose their jobs. But I think Aubrey President will uh, will land on his feet. He's, he's a energetic coach. Um, you know, he, I think he had a lot to do with Jeff Okuda playing some pretty good football. So I think he'll uh, he'll land on his feet. But obviously, tough situation for, for him here. And then, uh, then you roll into Tuesday and, and the trading of uh tight end TJ Hawkinson to Minnesota. Uh, Detroit gets a second round pick this year, a third round pick next year. Um, you know, they give up a fourth round pick um, and a conditional fourth round pick. And, and you know, obviously that's, you know, a, a difficult move to make if you're Brad Holmes. But, you know, I think when I look at that trade and, and I just see the fact that, you know, not a lot of movement had been made in terms of signing TJ long term, they obviously picked up the fifth year option, um, but there was nothing really moving toward a long term deal. And it just, I just got the sense that that you know he wasn't in the future plans for this organization. And so, if you can get something for him, a second round pick in this case, a third round pick the following year, and now you look at Detroit and what they're set up for, they got two first round picks, two second round picks, and what what's likely going to be a you know a pretty good pick in the third round that could potentially be five picks in the top sixty five. And so, look, you know Brad Holmes talked this week he, he stopped by and talked to reporters on Wednesday and, and, and said look this is um, you know this is a situation where we're still building toward the future um, and and acquiring those picks is you know something that that he values in, in terms of looking at the future of this franchise so um, you know now who you know you got to have some guys step up you know James Mitchell Brock Wright come to mind um, James Mitchell obviously has been rehabbing that that ACL he tore weeks two of his college season last year at Virginia Tech and they've been you know steadily giving him a little bit more reps he's been doing more in practice and look now that's going to get you know escalated a little bit he's going to have to step up and and um, you know make some plays Brock Wright's a veteran guy we saw last year when when TJ was out that that he was able to make some plays had a couple touchdowns and and, and so um, I think there's some comfortability there with him and, and the big one to me, I think the most immediate benefit in, in, in not having T.J. Hawkinson is probably going to be Amon Ross St. Brown. I mean, you just look at last year when T.J. missed those last five games because of the thumb injury, 55 targets, 41 catches, 474 yards, and four touchdowns for Amon Ross St. Brown in those five games. He really picked up the slack, and, and I can see Jared Goff and, and Ben Johnson kind of leaning on him again to, to you know, to fill that the, that need, but but I think some other guys are going to be in the mix. But I think the most immediate one, if you got Amon Ross St. Brown on your fantasy team, I, I think you're going to like the next few weeks here um, because he's going to be, I think, the one that 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 is impacted positively the most. Um, you, you know, some other news, you get some defensive players back. Obviously, you know that side of the football has been a struggle this year. But you know, getting guys, um, you know, like like uh, Harris back, uh, getting Sean Elliott back, getting Mike Hughes back. You know, I think that's going to infuse a little bit of energy into that side of the ball and we'll kind of see what kind of impact those guys can make but obviously a good sign when you start to get some talented players back like like Charles Harris who can rush the quarterback and Deshaun Elliott who had an interception of, you know a few weeks ago and is one of those guys that 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 can can make plays for you so that's big for this Lions defense and you know I, I guess you know another big thing Swift DeAndre Swift running back DeAndre Swift coming back um, into practice on Thursday that's obviously good news he sat out Wednesday which I, I could see maybe being a thing moving forward just to kind of keep him healthy, obviously dealing with the ankle and shoulder injuries. But him being back Thursday, I watched him uh, during the open period pretty exclusively. And, 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 you know, he looked pretty good. He said when we talked to him on Monday that he feels better uh, this week than he did last week. So obviously that's a good sign he's trending toward. And then you got to talk about the Packers, the, the Green Bay Packers coming into Ford Field this weekend at three and five. 
Let me repeat that. The Packers are three and five coming into Ford Field because I know in my time when Aaron Rodgers has been under quarterback, that has not been the case. So, you know, obviously they they're struggling. They're going through some transition offensively. Um, so it, it should be an interesting one. So those are the news and notes for the week. I'm going to have Rob Domofsky from ESPN. He's going to be talking, um, you know, Packers breaking that down. Uh, James Mitchell's going to join me this week. We'll obviously have, um, you know, the the bet MGM key match matchup segment and so it's a busy week so stay with me welcome back to the 20 minute in the huddle podcast and i am now joined by rob Domofsky of espn he does a great job covering the packers for espn rob thanks for taking the time i appreciate you yeah thanks for having me tim you know, it's a little bit strange. I mean, here we're a little bit used to some rough starts, uh, but three and five with Green Bay coming into Detroit. Yeah. Boy, we're not used to that. I'm sure you guys aren't over there either. It feels a little bit like 2016 when they were four and six. And if you remember, Tim, that's when Aaron Rodgers said at his locker that Wednesday after they lost to, I think it was Washington. I think we can run the table. Now he didn't say we were going to run the table. He said, I think we can. And sure enough, they won six in a row to finish the regular season and two in the playoffs to get to the NFC championship game, which is a pretty good run um, considering they're sitting at four and six. The difference this time is it, they, there aren't, there's no Jordy Nelson. There's no, um, you know, big play guy. They, They had Jared cook, big play tight end. They just had more weapons then. And it just, For me, it just doesn't quite feel like that's possible. Now, if you if we did this sitting there in 2016, I might have said the same thing at the time. Like, I'm not going to sit here and tell you I said, oh, yeah, they could run the table. I probably thought Rogers is crazy. What's he talking about? A lot of people have learned over the years not to uh, discredit Aaron Rodgers, but but like you mentioned, it is a little bit different team. It yeah. feels a little bit different. When you hear him talk now, he's obviously been vocal in the past. He's he's expressed frustration before. He's he's not afraid to do it. But I just get the sense from the outside looking in, Rob, that that this is a little bit different. That 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 he's really frustrated with 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 kind of what he's got to work with there. Is that fair? Yeah, it's hard to tell. Like I, I've I feel like I've taken a a master's level class at learning Aaron Rodgers language. And I still think I fail. Um, You know, like I I feel like there's two different Aaron Rodgers There's the guy on game day who is, you know, exasperated who, you know, he'll gesture a lot. He'll make faces. Um, And then, you know, a couple of days later at whether it's on Pat McAfee's show on Tuesday or, you know, with us on Wednesday, I kind of walk it back a little bit and be a little bit more um, tempered. And, and, and I'm not sure which is the one, you know, like which is the the guy that that really, you know, feels the way he, he does. So it, it's hard to tell. Um, I remember um, one of Brett Favre's last, I can't remember if it was 07, might have been his last season here. In that training camp, he was exasperated with receivers and, you'd see him gesturing all the time. And and I remember one time at a press conference, he was using his hands and he stopped and he looked at me and said, Oh, Rob, am I gesturing too much? Cause I had written about it. Like, <laughs> you know, like it's hard to know what these guys are really thinking. Yeah. I hear you. Were you a little bit surprised, Rob, that they didn't get anything done um, at the trade deadline? There were some talks they were kind of in on, on chase Claypool, the bears maybe swept in yeah. there and, and, and offered something a little bit better. Were you surprised maybe a, a backup move or something that they, that they didn't get anything done Tuesday? Yes. And no, Tim, like, no, I wasn't surprised because they never do that kind of thing. Yes. <laughs> I was surprised because it seemed like this was the year they were going to do it. It's like when we get to mock draft time, Every year, like I feel like in the last five years, I mocked them a first round receiver and they haven't taken a first round receiver since 2002, I believe. 20 the years. first time you don't will be the one they the, right. will be so the time like, they do. At some, at some point, I should just realize this is just not how they operate. You know, I've only been around here for 26 seasons. You'd think I'd learn by now. But <laughs> um, yeah, it's it just it was hard to tell. Like, I know they were you mentioned Claypool. I reported this, they were in on Claypool. In fact, for a similar same round draft pick, a second rounder. Um, and what I was told was they thought the bears pick was going to be higher, meaning they thought the bears were going to be worse this year. Um, they, they went back to the Packers and, you know, said, do you want to add anything, you know, another pick? And they, they said, no, I was also told, and I was 
sworn that I couldn't report the player, but that they had a, they thought they had a deal done with another offensive player. And that team um, decided just not to trade their player. Um, mm. It was a guy who just didn't get traded. Um, you know, and my source was like, look, we don't want to put a name of a player out there who, you know, is still on a team and, you know, makes sense. No, know he was going to get traded, but so there were really two chances, two legitimate chances that, that they made and neither of them worked out. You know, we've talked a lot about offense and defensively it's been interesting. I don't know if I've ever come across this just, just preparing for this and, 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 and talking to you 29th against the run. Uh, you know, yeah. 141.3 yards per game, but then second against the pass, 174.8. Right. That that such it different is. ends of the spear. Yeah. That is that just a case that teams have been able to run against them and maybe, you know, not throw as much, or is it just that that secondary is so much better than that front seven? What well, what do you explain such a difference there on defense? A little bit of it is teams have been ahead, you know, and then you just don't have to throw as much, you know, when right. you're ahead. Um, Because actually, they've had some trouble in coverage, especially with crossing routes. I mean, if you go back and look at Justin Jefferson in week one, I mean, he wide open over the middle. Um, They had a couple of times that happened in in subsequent games. I believe the Giants game in London, that was a problem. But, you know, even going back to last year, I think they finished ninth in total defense, but they were 29th in yards allowed per carry. And to me, like, that's the that's the big one, like yards per attempt not total yards, whatever, but it's yards per attempt. And they they have not fixed that, um, which is really surprising to me. And, and I think it is surprising to them too, because they put, um, you know, they thought they had a dominant defense. They had every, essentially everybody back. They repaid or they re-signed and paid to Dev- Andre Campbell, who had a great year inside linebacker. They re-signed Rasul Douglas, who was basically the star of their defense the second half of the season. And they used their first round pick, both of their first round picks, on defensive guys, Tim, they have seven first round picks on defense and they have four guys that are second contract guys that weren't, you know, first round picks. So they put, I don't know how much more resources they can put into it. Um, Joe Barry, the coordinator is taking a lot of heat right now. Um, You know, I'm not sure if that's justified or not, but um, they certainly seem like they have the talent to be better than they are. And I'm speaking with Rob Domofsky of ESPN. He does a great job covering the Packers up there in Green Bay. Uh, we That's going to be such a, a an interesting matchup when you talk about the run defense and the yards yeah. per carry facing a Detroit team, obviously, that that's kind of um, had their struggles, obviously. But offensively, the one consistent minus last week has really been their, their ability to run the football. Do you see that as, as a key matchup? I mean, Detroit's offensive line is one of their strengths. It's yeah. what they want to do. They're going to be stubborn in doing it, too, and, right. and especially at home. Is that a key matchup in this one for, for Green Bay, you think? Yeah, it was interesting this week. I, I maybe was a little surprised to hear Matt LaFleur say that he thought the Lions have one of the best, if not the best, offensive lines in football. Um, you know, and, and I guess, you know, I don't think that was just him, you know, coach speaking it because he's not going to say that if he just doesn't have to. It, it was he brought it up unprompted. So, um, you know, that's an area where, you know, I think, look, the Packers have lost at the line of scrimmage, both offensively and defensively all year. Um, they've, they've been handled up front um, when their offense is on the field and they haven't been able to do the same to opposing offenses. And really, you know, if you want to boil it down to one, well, two things really, but one basic thing, um, you know, it's not that Aaron Rodgers doesn't have the weapons and maybe he doesn't, but he hasn't had the time to throw. And it's not that, um, you know, they just, and, and on defense, they've been manhandled. Their front has not been able to, you know, shed blocks, has not been able to get into the backfield enough and it's really that that's you know of all their problems you know it I think it boils down to to those two areas which is really the same thing so Green Bay comes to Detroit they get back on track they get to four and five and and try to keep pace with the Minnesota Vikings if what happens Rob well I mean they've got to find something they can hang hang their hat on Um, like that's the thing like this team has no identity um, you know, either offensively or defensively. Defensively, they can't take the ball away at all. Like, I think they have like three interceptions, maybe. It's it's not many. Um, they've got they've they've taken they've had one takeaway that they've turned into points this year. One. Wow. Um, you know, and, and so that's not good. And then offensively, they, they just haven't found anything like they call staples, like the, the plays that are, you know, Alan Lazard explained it to me this way: the 10 to 15 plays that they can take into every single game 
regardless of opponent and know they're going to work. And they've always had those in the past. And he told me this was like two weeks ago. He said, we haven't found those yet. Um, and, and they just they just don't have an identity. If they can somehow find and establish that identity, they have a chance to turn this thing around. But, um, you know, at this point, I'm not sure. You know, I mean, they used to, you know, every year they'd go to Detroit and you'd make your prediction and, yeah, they're going to win, you know, 24 to 10 and 31 to 7, whatever. I don't know. I really don't know. And it's interesting, too, because you look at Detroit struggles defensively. I mean, last in the league in points allowed, last yeah. league, league in total defense, last in third down. I mean, yep. 27th in, in, in against the run. I mean, they, they, they've been bad, really, in all phases. Yeah. So it'll be interesting to see if, if this is a game where Green Bay can maybe come in and, and, and find those few things that they do, right? Find that recipe. Right. You know, th- I thought this was really interesting. Um uh, it's been 12 games since Aaron Rodgers has thrown for 300 yards. It's the longest wow. streak of his career, you know, and then, cause I was looking at Detroit's defensive numbers and, you know, knowing that Rodgers hadn't had a big game in a while. And, and I thought, well, if, if he doesn't throw for 300 this week, he may never throw for 300. <laughs> you, you might've just cemented that Rob. <laughs> <laughs> hey, thank you so much. Great stuff for taking the time to do a great job up there for ESPN and uh, safe travels here to Detroit. I'll make sure I stop by the press box and say yeah, hello. Appreciate it. Look forward to seeing everybody on Sunday. Welcome back to the 20 in the Huddle podcast presented by Microsoft. And I have a special guest in, James Mitchell, fifth round draft pick of the Detroit Lions, tight end. And obviously, you know, James, the big news of of the week, you know, TJ Hawkinson was traded. I guess Mm -hmm. just first off, your first reaction to the news. And and did you have a chance to reach out to TJ or did he reach out to you guys at all? Uh, Yeah, first reaction, obviously, I was probably, I mean, just as shocked as everybody else, but also just got to understand that that's part of it. yeah, and he actually reached out to us um, maybe a few minutes after it happened and just told us that he was appreciative of us and, you know, he was always there for us if we ever need anything, and I kind of told him the same. You know, just appreciate him just doing things for me and giving me advice while, while I've been here. So, And that's important, right, for a rookie to have a vet that, 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 that's been here, to just been around a little bit. How, how much did he help you along in, in, in kind of this process? You obviously have been battling the rehab of, of the knee injury, slower start to the season, but now you've, you've started come on, got your first catch out of the way last week. How did yeah. that feel? The catch was – it felt good. I thought I was, got that one out of <laughs> yeah. the way. I've kind of been waiting on that one. Um, so I was glad I got that opportunity. But, yeah, he's helped me a lot. Um, even when it's not him vocally telling me something, whether just me watching him, how he handles himself, how he carries himself, and, you know, just taking – trying to see how he does things throughout his game and, you know, seeing if I can add it to mine, what works, you know, that sort of thing. So just the overall experience having him here, uh, a vet and a, a really good tight end has, has been helpful. And, but now, obviously, with, with him gone, there's, you know, somebody's got to step up. There, there's more opportunities for other guys, Brock Wright, yourself included. Mm-hmm. Just how excited are you for the opportunity to, to, to play more, to kind of maybe step up and, and, and fill, you know, some of that void? Yeah, I'm definitely very excited. Obviously, this is why you come to the National Football League, why you want to play uh, or why you want to be here. You want to play and contribute and help somebody win. Um, but um, I'm also excited for the whole room. Uh, I love those those guys in there. They, they've all helped me a tremendous amount since, since I've got here. Um, and I just think we have a really good tight-knit group that uh, is ready to step up. You know, take me back to that knee injury because you were playing so well at the time. You look at your sophomore year, you're averaging 17.2 yards per reception. I mean, that's a big play threat. I mean, that's like wide receiver stuff right there, James. <laughs> it's 16.7 the next year. And so you're playing so well. You're going into your senior year. And, and just take me to, the, to, the, to that day and just how, how, how devastating was that? Oh, uh, yeah. That that uh, Sunday, I was, I was heartbroken really um because like you said I felt like I was playing some of my best ball uh you know in my junior year I played really well and then I decided to come back and you know I really elevated my game I felt like uh, strength wise mentally heading into my senior year uh so that second game when they told me that Sunday I I was heartbroken because you know I felt like that was the year I could really take the next step um but you know I had a great support system with my family with my church back home with the guys at Virginia Tech and really everybody around Blacksburg to be honest with you um so that helped me a lot and you know I was able to get through it and you know still 
be around the guys, which which actually helped the process out a lot. You know, and it was a slow process here, obviously, as you continue to rehab that. Um, but I guess where are you at right now, just physically? Obviously, you're back. The reps are starting to build. Mm-hmm. You're starting to make some plays, as we saw last week. And, and I guess where are you feeling physically? Are you, are you kind of ready to go, ready for that increase of, of, of snaps and, and, and roll? Yeah, I believe I am. Um, this is the best I've felt physically since the injury happened, uh, just as far as, you know, my knee and the stiffness. The stiffness is gone. You know, I'm feeling more explosive and things like that. And, you know, I feel like I'm running better. So as far as physically, it feels the best I've felt since the injury. Um, so I think I'm ready for that increase. And, you know, a big part of it is still taking care of care of it, even though you know, I feel good, you know, still doing treatment, still doing, listen, going to the trainer, seeing what I can do to, you know, keep it that way. How important is that is that relationship with, with, with Jared Goff? And we talked to him on Wednesday and he said, you know, that, that kid's building trust with me. I mean, he's been making some plays in practice, obviously the play last week, but how important is that relationship and, and how much have you guys been able to work and, and, and kind of build that up as, as, as we get now into the second half of the season? Yeah, I mean, it's very important, obviously, especially with me not um, not doing anything in the spring, um, kind of limited in um, training camp at first and, you know, kind of coming on late in training camp. Um, so I didn't really get much time with them uh, really up until maybe a week or two ago, honestly. Um, so that's very important. And for me, you know, I'm a quiet, laid back guy. So it's it's like you like you said, just trying to make plays in practice, um, show that I know the game plan and, you know, just really just try to have no MAs and just be sharp with everything I do. You know, I always like to dig into guys who are going to be on the podcast history a little bit, background maybe. Maybe there's a little backstory, something fun there. And I, I, I know there's a cause that's dear to your heart, and it is to mine too. It, it's breast cancer awareness because your mom obviously dealt with that. My mom was a three-time breast cancer survivor too. So uh, when I when I looked at that and saw that, I, I saw, well, that's really relatable. But then you, you told a story that, that – because of that, you were really never supposed to be here, right? I mean, can you well, tell can you tell the story? So it was actually not breast cancer. It was so she had my twin sisters. Okay. Uh, in '94, and then she got bone cancer after that. Okay. So after she went through that battle, they had told her that you know you'll never conceive again, and then it was like five years later they were got pregnant with the son so yeah you're the miracle i'm the miracle that's what my dad calls me calls me the miracle child and he tells that story in church all the time and then it was in i was in sixth grade uh so i guess i was 12 Uh, she got diagnosed with breast cancer uh so that was hard to hear as a you know as a young kid you you really only think of one thing i mean to be honest with you um, that's hard to hear as the same way as a sixth grader so that was that was rough but once again i mean my friends, my sister's friends, uh, our church family, I mean, they were cooking us meals, offering to take us to school. Like, it was it was unbelievable, really, the support, and uh, that helped a lot. And, you know, thank God she, she got through it. Strong woman. Yeah, no doubt. No <laughs> Your doubt. hero? For sure. Yeah, for mine sure. too, 100%. Were they, were they there Sunday, by chance? They were not there Sunday. No, my friends from ho- my friends from home actually ask. came oh, up. Yeah. So you had all your friends. <clears throat> yeah, uh, from two of my friends, uh, Tanner Kennedy and Caden Gibson. They came up. They're two of my best friends from high school. So they got to see my first catch, and they were pretty excited. So that was, that was awesome. So now that obviously you're going to be a bigger part of the game plan this week, does do the, the ticket requests go up this week at all? Have you, have you <laughs> had your phone blown up at all? Do you got some requests or? Um, because the writing's on the wall. I mean, you're gonna, you're gonna, you know, you're gonna play a little, you're gonna play some, some bigger roles here moving forward. Yeah, I, I wouldn't say there's too, been too many requests. Uh, my mom and dad are coming this week, um, but they had planned to come. I will yeah. say that. Um, <laughs> but I'm glad that they'll get to come, um, and you know, see. Ho- hopefully, I get some more reps, and they'll get to see that and be there for that. So. Um. What do you want to see more consistently Consistently with us? Obviously, the first month of the season, explosive, right? You guys were right there among the leaders offensively. Struggled the next two weeks against you know New England and, and Dallas. Got it back last week, but just for kind of a half, penalties mm-hmm. got in the way. Just what do you guys need to do offensively to kind of keep that just consistently rolling? Because we've seen how good you guys can be in, in flashes. Yeah, I think we just can't kill ourselves. Um, you know, self-inflicted things. We can't have those because, um, like you said, we were really hot in the first half, and we, we just got to finish that and just compliment the defense um, and defense compliment us. Just pick each other up. Um, but yeah, I would say just the biggest thing is we just got to finish finish a uh, full game. Well, I know Lions fans are going to be excited to see what you bring to the table. Fifth round draft pick, getting healthy, and and 
like we talked about earlier, you were a playmaker in college, so uh, Lions fans are being excited. Thanks for joining me. He's James Mitchell. Look out for him Sunday against Green Bay. He's going to play a big role. Yes, sir. Thank you. Welcome back to the 20 Minute in the Huddle podcast presented by Microsoft. And look, it's Green Bay Packers Detroit Lions week. So who better than to come and join me on the podcast is a former Green Bay Packer mm-hmm. and a former Detroit Lion. He is TJ Lang. TJ, thanks for joining me. I appreciate yeah, no you. No problem, man. Actually, the first time, I think in the last three years, Tim, that these two teams haven't met up on my birthday. Really? Yeah. So I don't. Uh, it doesn't ruin my day. You know, I was able to enjoy my birthday this year. Well, yeah, happy, last year Monday night football. Yeah. The year before that birthday, I'm like, man, I think the commissioner hates me with this schedule. He doesn't want me to have any fun on my birthday. <laughs> Two teams going against. Did each you do anything right. fun for your birthday? Uh, no, no. I think I just golfed and. Yeah, that's you're golfing right. in November, bud. That's yeah, that's that's not bad. Schedules late uh, October, early schedules November. Schedules around the kids now, so I don't get much time to myself anymore. I know <laughs> how that goes. You know, this is the key matchup segment, and you know we look at five key ones, and and the first one for me, Malcolm Rodriguez and, and Aaron Jones. Yeah. You know, Malcolm Rodriguez coming off a you know another good game for him. Had that seven tackles, one sack, had the fumble recovery, and and you look at Aaron Jones, 143 yards against Buffalo. Yeah. That offense has struggled, but that's been really one of the more consistent. things. Things is, is their ability to run the football. Just what do you see from that matchup? What's the key one, key there? Well, I, I think the, where I like to give Malcolm a, maybe a little bit of an edge is because he's a very fast downhill linebacker. There's not a lot of, and that's what they ask him to do defensively. They want him uh, to get down line of scrimmage, try to pull off some of those double teams that those D tackles are facing. And that actually goes against what Aaron Jones is really good at too, or uh, meshes up well because Aaron Jones is. He's not a patient runner. He doesn't sit back there and read and, and, (laughs) and, you know, cutting back. Like, he is through the line of scrimmage so dang fast. He's just a lightning bolt back there. Um, and he's he's not an overly powerful guy, but he just get, he gathers so much speed in such a short amount of space and hits that line so fast. And that's where I think, look, this is going to be a good opportunity for not only uh, Malcolm but the other linebackers to show off what they've been good at and what they what the coaches want them to do as far as getting downhill and and meeting those running backs at the line of scrimmage. Uh, the Detroit Lions defense has been. Um, in trouble a little bit, those linebacker groups when they start to over pursue, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and now you're opening up the backside for a whole lot uh, of big plays. Uh, Aaron Jones, you know what you're going to get. He's coming, he's coming right downhill. He's coming right at you, and he comes with a lot of power for being a little guy. But he's, you know, that's going to be Green Bay's game plan. I think they tried to get back to it last week as far as getting 33 as many touches as possible. Uh, we know they kind of run into ran into a bus saw against yeah. the Buffalo Bills. Uh, they're just playing at a different level of football than anybody else. But I would expect them to uh, continue to make thirty three. The the younger Aaron, the the, <laughs> the, uh, the key uh, key aspect of their offense, and that's just how that's that's the way that they they've won football games in the past three years under Matt Lafleur. So it's going to be a heck of a challenge for Malcolm Rodriguez to to bring him down the line of scrimmage and not allow any of those explosive games. Stick with what you're good at, right? Yeah. I mean, you win football games when you look at Green Bay when they're successful. It's when 33 is involved in that exactly. offense, a big part. Whether that's running the football or you know catching yeah. it, and that's another area that Malcolm's got to be really good at yep. too, and has proven that he. He can be is playing in space and, and they're going to try to get Aaron in space some of those screens some of those short yep. stuff and he's just got to be a good tackler they got to rally to the football yeah and if you're Green Bay like you said Tim I mean every year they kind of go through a little bit of a rough stretch and Hey, why did we lose the game? And you look at it and you're like, well, Aaron Jones got six touches. You know, yeah. like that's, your, that's one of your most dynamic players now. Ding, I think. Ding, there right. it is. And even though they didn't beat the Buffalo Bills, I think they started to figure out offensively the way that we gain rhythm, uh, the way that we make our young offensive line comfortable is by running the ball. I don't think that's a team that's set up anymore to just drop back 40, 45 times and, and throw no. the ball because they're very, they're very youthful on the outside as well. And let, let's move up front. Penny Sewell versus Rashawn Gary. And yeah. you look at Rashawn Gary, he's had a terrific start mm-hmm. to, yeah. to, to the season. Six sacks, 11 quarterback hits, seven tackles for loss, leads the Packers in all three categories. And it's a terrific matchup with Penny because, look, you know offensive line play better than anybody. From the outside looking in, I mean, right now he looks like one of the better right tackles in football. I mean, he is a confident young man. Yeah. He's really athletic, knows how to use that athleticism, you know, you know on, on that right side. And, and that should be a great matchup on Sunday, don't you think? No, it should be. And Panay, to me, just looks so comfortable in what he's doing. And uh, he's combining that with confidence. I mean, he's 
You know, he doesn't really seem like a cocky type player, but you know, if he beats up on you, he's going to let you know. Yeah. About it. I mean, he <laughs> takes pride in that as most offensive linemen should. Um, he just looks like for a 22 year old kid. The scary thing for me is like, 22. what's he going to look like when he's 25, 26? Yeah, like right. He's going to only continue to get better. And that for me is so exciting um, just because he already does look like a pretty polished dude at right tackle. He's only been playing there for a year and a half. So You marvel um, at his athleticism? You do. You have to. I mean, I played with a lot of guys who, you know, whether it was 305, whether it was 350, you know, moving like tight ends and, you know, just doing some crazy athleticism, uh, a- athletic feats in the weight room. And it's just like, my goodness, man. Like, he's one of those guys, and he makes it look easy. Like, yeah. he really does. You never really see him. Uh, put him, put his body or, you know, his angle. You never really see him get in bad positions. Mm-hmm. You know, I think where you see him get in trouble a little bit is maybe, you know, with his hands a little bit. Maybe he'll, he'll try to bait somebody a little too. And, you know, that's that, that's an area that he's still improving at. Uh, but in my opinion, he's still very good at. But his footwork to me is just uh, what's really stood out this year. He doesn't put himself in, in many bad spots. And on the flip side, Rashawn Gary is a guy who um, kind of a, you know, little bit different type. I mean, a lot of people I thought, you know, look at him as being a more power rusher. Right. He came in as a converted, you know, D-tackle from college and moved outside linebacker You're thinking, okay, this guy's going to bull rush me every time. Like, he's he's actually a really good athlete out there. He can bend the corner. Um, he can get in the backfield in a hurry. I think his first step off the ball is pretty impressive because it really, you know, if you're, if you're that tackle and you're a split second late off the ball and that guy gets by you, I mean, it's going to spell trouble. So that's... Uh, Panay's had some really good matchups so far this year. I mean, just looking a couple weeks back against Micah Parsons, um, you know, Micah didn't really do much against him uh, in the passing game. And, you know, I I think that this kid every week, you know, no no matter what right tackle, left tackle, you're going against big-time players now. And Panay Sewell, it's just another chance for him to add to to an already impressive resume. His confidence has got to be sky high right now, the way he played against Micah and some of those guys. A half sack all year against, like you said, some of the talented rushers that he sees every week. I mean, it's a production-based business, and and, and Panay's been as productive as as anyone else. Yeah, and I think especially when you look at, you know, kind of the offensive rut they've been in the last three weeks now you're asking this offensive line to probably pass protect more than you would like yeah. and I think we all know that they, they want to run the ball they want to run the play action you don't want to sit back there and just throw you know 30 drop back passes uh, but you know they had to do it against New England they had to do it against Dallas late in the game and they had to do it a little bit last week against Miami and you know the whole offensive line stood up to all but the, you know Panay shows that He's not just a mauler in the run game. I mean, he can he can be a dancing bear back there in the pass protection game too. And I know that uh, you know his offensive line mates really appreciate him, and I'm sure Jared Goff does as well. I know you're a radio guy, but that's a nice little segue here on video oh, into my God. into the next matchup here because, like we talked about with Malcolm Rodriguez and Aaron Jones, I think it's DeAndre Swift and Quay Walker. Now, obviously, Devondre Campbell is is kind of their guy, but he's dealing with an injury; he hasn't yeah. been at practice, so it, it, they might have to rely on Quay, a rookie, uh, much more. You got two Georgia boys here right and yeah and uh for deandre he, he, we talked to him this week he, he feels a little bit better than he did last week he returned to practice on thursday after sitting out wednesday and yeah. th- that might be a thing with him moving forward maybe you, you sit out a wednesday or you sit out of practice just kind of preserve him a little bit more but look this is a, a much better offense when when deandre swift yeah. is a bigger part oh, of it no you know got 33 no. snaps and 10 touches last week Part of that, I think, was just him working his way back. But he's the explosive element, especially with TJ Hawkinson not there. Yeah. It, it, to me, it's St. Brown and it's DeAndre Swift, right? Yeah. And so I think that matchup is going to be a very interesting one, too. Walker second on the team behind Campbell with 56 tackles. But I think this one's more about Swift and, and how can the Lions get him involved, get him back to making some of those big plays. Yeah, and like you mentioned, I think it's just about the health. I know Coach mentioned after the Miami game that – um, you know, it's good to have Swift back out there, but he wasn't ready. You yeah. know, I think they kind of felt like maybe they pushed it a little bit, and you can understand that. I mean, everybody, of course, you want one of your most dynamic players on right. the field, right? Especially with the way this season has turned out, and you know, backs kind of being against the wall. But um, hopefully, that hopefully he's healthy. I mean, even when he's out there, 
on a pitch count, like you mentioned, only 10 touches last week, he makes a difference. We saw that in the passing game last last week against Miami in the red zone. You know, coming out, getting one-on-one with the linebacker, doing a little shimmy shake and see over the middle, you know, for a touchdown. He's going like to win that matchup yeah, he's gonna every time. It. And it kind of reminds me of, uh, you know, a Theo Riddick type guy, you know, yeah. where you put a you put a linebacker on that dude, like you've Good got luck. no chance, you Good know luck. what I mean? So that's just a, that's a huge advantage for this offense. Um, and, and with DeAndre, it's been – we, we've all known who he is. He's a very dynamic, explosive playmaker for this offense. The only question is the health, right? Yeah. And I know he's been dinged up a little bit each year. And, and this year, you know, missing the – I think it was three games and coming back a little bit last week, maybe not being himself. Hopefully that extra week, uh, you know, practice throughout this week lets him heal up because they need him. They, they need just him. do. And like you mentioned – Missing Hawkinson, that's a big target over the middle of the field. Now teams are going to start to probably look to take away 14 first right. rather than 88. Um, that's just going to give you – it's going to give you more options when it comes to the passing attack as far as the running backs are concerned. So, uh, Quay Walker, you look at on the flip side too, I mean, he's got a lot of speed. He, he really does. does. That's the thing that sticks out. He's a big dude. Uh, but That's gets, a good duel there with him and Campbell. It really is. And, and Campbell got hurt against Buffalo. We'll yeah. have to, you know, it'll probably be a game-time decision. But Quay Walker is – you know, he reminds me of kind of like a Devin White type where you see in Tampa where he's just a sideline to sideline guy. It's really hard to, you know, you want to get those outside zones, you want to get those tosses, jet sweeps, whatever it is to the edge. You're going to have to make sure you get a hat on him because yeah. he's that type of dude that can run from the far left hash to the right sideline and make a play. <laughs> yeah. You know what I mean? Like, you just have to be aware of where he's at. Um, then DeAndre, look. I hope he's healthy because yeah. he is a big difference maker when he is. And it's interesting, too. You look at that Green Bay defense, and, and I almost did a double take. You see they're second in the league against the pass, I think 174 yards, but yeah. then 29th against the run. Some of that's been – they've been behind, and, and teams have been able to run. But that's very atypical of a, of a Green Bay defense. So, again, yeah. the importance of Swift, it looks like there's some opportunities in the run game to make some plays and, 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 and gash them for some big ones. Yeah. So you hope Swift's back healthy. Yeah, you do. And, th- and that's – going to be important I, mean, I know you just mentioned the run game I mm-hmm. mean you're going to have to be able to run the ball we I know that Green Bay's kind of taken a lot of heat the past couple weeks and um, you know people starting to say they're done and the run could be over this is still a really good football team in my opinion they yeah. just haven't found their way of really finding that identity so far but like you said this isn't a team that you want to get into that game where you know, you're down two scores, you're down three scores, nope. and all of a sudden Not they're getting that. comfortable on Front offense, seven. Yeah. and you're back there having to throw the ball to catch up. You just nope. can't do it. So DeAndre Swift, he, he's going to play a big impact in the run game, hopefully. All right, we got two more. Jeff Okuda, who has played terrific, and, and they're still trying to figure some things out there in Green Bay with this young wide receiver core. But one guy it seems like Aaron's maybe getting a little more comfortable with is Romeo Dobbs, um, the rookie out of uh, Nevada, I believe it is. Um one catch, 18 yards allowed by Okuda last week. All those yards, right? All those plays. He's been really the one consistent guy in that secondary. And you look like you, you look at Dobbs, 30 catches, 296 yards, three touchdowns. He's been one of the more productive wide receivers, as again, as they try to kind of figure that out with Aaron Rodgers. But I think that's a key matchup when those two guys are on, especially when, when Aaron looks to go down the field. It, it seems like Romeo's kind of been that guy for yeah. him. And, and you know, with Jeff playing as well as he is, that, that could be definitely an interesting matchup come Sunday. Yeah, it should. And I think that Jeff has – earned a lot of praise this year I mean you know what he went through in year one and trying to live up to the you know expectation and the hype of being a top three pick coming back last year getting hurt yeah um, you know people are starting to question hey what do we really have here and he, he's just he's put in so much hard work this season um, to just get back getting back to playing at a high level and I've been impressed with his game uh, not only, you know, he looks like he's playing more confident. He looks like the game's starting to slow down a little bit for him where he's not playing a whole lot of catch-up anymore as rather than, you know, a- anticipating what's coming. Yeah. And you see that a lot where I think it really sticks out um, is the run game. I mean, he's fearless. Physical. Like, he is physical. Those 15 tackles in, in Dallas. Dallas. I, mean, I mean, I think it was the first cornerback since yeah. 1994 to have 15 it, tackles in a game. It's insane, and that's, you know, that's just – that's his mentality. Yeah. That, you know, he's going to do anything it takes to – you know, help his team win and help his defense improve. So, um, Jeff's, you know, he's been a he's been a constant positive, I, I would say, for this defense so far. Now, um, we'll see what this secondary looks like as a whole. I mean, obviously, they've had a bit of a tough week losing your position coach. Um, you know, as a player, I've been through that a couple times where mm-hmm. you lose a coach, and I can tell you firsthand, 
you take most of the blame for it, you right? Yourself, because right? you say, yeah, yeah if all we're, if we're better on Sundays, you know, if we're out there competing and executing and doing what we're supposed to do, yeah. you know, those guys aren't going to pay for it. And it is what it is, man. And it's a, it's a, this this game is about uh, competing and, and winning. And, you know, it's been no surprise. The secondary as a whole, it's been a little bit disappointing. Now, Very. you know, they can use that uh, hopefully – as positive momentum and and hopefully it's a wake-up call to the rest of the group to say uh you know what man like we're not playing up to our level of expectation we're not playing up to uh you know our talent and what we expect as yeah. far as production so um you know sometimes that that can as 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 as, as rude as it may sound that can send a wake-up call to a lot of people that can really change the course of uh, of a game or of a season so because what's um, next right yeah i mean I what's mean, next after that i mean the position coach codes the only thing yeah. next is changes to the players right. you know and, yeah. and wholesale changes and and so you've got to stick step back and think about that and we've already seen that a little bit too we saw yeah. it with imani who's a healthy scratch against new england we saw it the past couple of weeks with michael brockers who is a veteran captain on this team that's been a healthy scratch as well so um you know hopefully this is the maybe you, you would say the last uh, you know, wake up call that these guys need to before they start saying, guys, like, come on, we got to <laughs> start got, playing yeah. better. And you look at the flip side of that matchup, Romeo Dubs as well. Uh, he's a speedy guy, man. Mm -hmm. He's got some sneaky speed. He doesn't, you know, he's not going to burn you down the field um, just off the line of scrimmage, but he's, he can, he does a nice job separating. And he's for, you know, his ball skills for being a young player um, are really, really good. I mean, I remember just watching that catch he had last week against Buffalo, and it's like, Dude spins around three times, still locates the ball, and he catches it while you know he's got an arm up in his through, face there, like, yeah. and, and, and under you know between <laughs> his hands, like whoa, man, that's like really impressive for a yeah. rookie. So I think he is the one player when you talk about the Green Bay offense and their passing attack that Aaron Rodgers is starting to get more comfortable with. Yeah. Um, Sammy Watkins has battled a lot of injuries. Christian Watson, the second round pick. Battle a lot of injuries. Came back last week against Buffalo, gets Concussion. hurt again. Don't yeah. know if he's going to be available. But Dobbs would definitely be, in my opinion, uh, when you talk about those outside matchups, he would be the first guy I would put up there to say, we got to stop yep. this guy. All right. I would be remiss if I did not talk about the last matchup with your former quarterback. I know you're pretty close <laughs> yeah. with, with Aaron. And, and look, Aaron's never been one to, to to shy away from expressing his frustrations, mm -hmm. um, and he's done that. Um, and we alluded to a little bit. I think the key matchup there for me is Aaron Rodgers versus Aaron Glenn. You know, the, yeah. the, the, the Aaron's Aaron Glenn isn't going to throw anything at Aaron Rodgers that he hasn't seen already. Right, right. It's just about can they fix some of the big mistakes that they're making. We talked to Aaron Glenn this week, and he said he look he spent more time in that defensive backs room since they you know, let go of Aubrey Pleasant. Um, and he just said, look, it's not been good enough. The, the missed assignments, he, he referenced the Waddle touched on the 29 yarder, how they were supposed to be a safety over top. And yeah. I think that's been, when, when when we watch it, just the missed assignments, the yeah. blown coverages, some of those things, like you can't do that stuff against Aaron Rodgers no. because he will see it <laughs> right away and yeah. he'll make the right play. Like, like we said, you, you you're not going to throw anything at him he hasn't seen. So I just think that's a key matchup. Can, can Aaron Glenn push the right buttons to, to, to not have the blown assignments? Just have guys where they need to be. I think that's step one. Aaron's still going to make some plays, but but don't give him the easy ones like right. you did last week against Tua. And, and and I think that that's a key matchup. What do you think of that one? Yeah, no, I like it a lot. And, you know, Aaron Rodgers, with, with how much negativity there's been around the Green Bay Packers and how disappointing their start has been, um, I still tell people I'm not betting against them only yeah. because they have Aaron Rodgers. Right. Like, I've you seen can. him do it so many times so throughout many his times. 18-year career where, <laughs> hey, they're four and six. Wow, they need to win out to have a chance. And they win out. Right. And they go to playoffs and go to the <laughs> NFC Championship. So it's like I'm not betting against that guy. Like he's just he is what he is, man. He's a special player. Um, with that being said, defensively, Aaron Glenn, what I want to see is a little bit more of the tendency breakers. You know, in that I, I mean, third down, right? I think every game every post game throughout the last three or four games, you kind of hear what the opponents are saying. And I think it started with with New England and, and Dallas and a little bit Miami. Everybody's saying, oh, we knew what they were going to do on third down. Oh, we knew they were going to play you know, zone on first down and then go to a man later yeah. on third down. And right. it's like... Teams know this, right? And I get, I get. You have you're youthful. You have a lot of injuries that you're battling. You're trying to simplify things, but at the same time, 
I would like to see a little bit more breaking those tendencies, maybe being a little bit more observant of your self-scout. Hey, third down, we're playing whatever it is, you know, 87% man coverage. Other teams know that, too. They're going to give us their best man beaters. Sure. You know what I mean? Yeah. Change it up a little bit. No, Show the man. Drop it back in the yeah. zone because I go back to the last – Last time these two teams met uh, to end the season last year, and you remember that first half, Aaron Rodgers played, Devontae Adams played. Like, there were a lot of plays in that game where Aaron Rodgers was sitting back there and looking confused. Like, he didn't know where to go with the ball because I think they were mixing up coverages, and they were doing a nice job yeah. with, with with showing pressure, dropping out, showing coverage, bringing pressure that were kind of confusing him a little bit. So maybe he's just the type of player, Aaron Rodgers. He, he studies so much film, and he's so aware, and he's seen – really at all throughout the NFL that you're going to have to change something because if you just line up and try to do what you do, he's going to make you pay for it. Yeah. So I think there's going to have to be, um, like I said, hopefully some unscouted looks that we haven't seen from this defense so far because if you just line up and play cover two, he's going to beat you. If you line up and play man, you know he's going to check to a man yeah. leader and he's probably going to beat you. He's just that good. Um, so I think that it's going to be an interesting – Probably game of, of cat and mouse a little bit between the two Aaron's here and Rodgers and Aaron Glenn <laughs> as far as let's get let's get in this guy's head. Don't yeah. make him comfortable. Don't show him the same coverage on third down. You know every single time. Mix it up a little bit. Hey, the first third down we usually bring pressure. Let's show that pressure and back out. You know maybe turn it into a three man rush and maybe make him scramble a right. little bit. Um, so that for me is going to be. That's going to definitely be a storyline to watch. Awesome. Hey, that's great stuff. Well, I appreciate it, i got to have it, you on Thank every you. week. Oh, I, I yeah, this can't might do be every a permanent week. segment. I can't do every I, week. This is really, really good. <laughs> I love I it. Get to, I'll give you one, maybe once a, once a month. I well, you guys can week, also though. tune in 97.1. <laughs> TJ will be on the field giving great updates uh, on the radio broadcast as well. You do a great job with Thank that, you, by man. the way. Appreciate yeah, it. Thank yeah, you. really good. A lot of fun. Well, that was Key Matchups presented by BetMGM. He is TJ Lang. That was great stuff.